say former worship? <laughs> you always worship. <laughs> Whatever you are. To our um, seventh annual spring luncheon supporting the historic Ralph Connor House and the University of Williams Club. It goes without saying, but I think I will anyway, that Susan Thompson is a person who really needs no introduction. For those of us who have been, uh, or those of you who have been new to Winnipeg, or been living in a tree somewhere, you will wish to know that Susan was twice elected mayor of Winnipeg starting in 1992, and through her terms saw the growth of the city in many ways. Too many to mention uh, here today, I think you should just uh, buy the book and read the book. Uh, I would point though to the flood of the century which in my mind uh, was a defining moment in her reign, uh, along with helping to bring the Pan Am Games uh, to Winnipeg. I, like many of you, got to know Susan and the mayor through her appearances on TV during the flood. Happy anniversary, this is the 20th anniversary of the flood. Uh, may it never happen again. And so uh, calming us with her clear information about what was happening, what was being done, and her assurances that we would pull through. And we did, and I watched her every day on TV, and uh, it was extremely helpful in talking to people, well, yes, I saw the mayor on TV, and everything will be okay. <laughs> she was and still is the consummate communicator, just what the city needed, I think, during that rough time. I'll mention then that she went on to do a few more firsts, where I previously had owned her own business, the first woman Rotarian in Manitoba, the first woman Consul General at the Canadian Consulate in Minneapolis, and founding president and CEO of the University of Winnipeg Foundation. In 2016, she was honored with the Order of Manitoba and an honorary Doctor of Laws from the University of Winnipeg. Today, she continues her interest in Winnipeg, even though she moved to Vancouver. I don't know why, but Because <laughs> she continues her interest in Winnipeg by working with the Winnipeg Art Gallery and their latest project on the Inuit Art Pavilion. She's published her fascinating book, His, Her, Slash, Worship, Moments in History, Moments of Time, and the book will be available uh, at the end of uh, her presentation. And in it, Susan comes through as a warm, practical woman with lots to give in any capacity. Susan will be signing copies of her, uh, her book, as I said, uh, after her talk. So, at this point, please welcome me in joining her mayor, her, her worship, <laughs> Susan. And I look forward to listening to her again. Well, first of all, let me begin by saying happy spring. <laughs> Aren't we lucky to be here today in this beautiful setting? And I want you all to know this is my red robin. <laughs> when it's springtime, I wear this brooch. And uh, when I was coming into Winnipeg, I uh, shared my emails back and forth with Carolyn. And I said, uh, you're in charge of the weather, Carolyn. And I think it had just snowed. <laughs> and so when I flew in uh, on Thursday and, and saw that uh, Winnipeg was ready for, for spring, on with the brooch. So uh, indeed, not only is it happy spring to each and every one of you, but uh, it's like a reunion. It's, I'm, I'm getting a chance to uh, say hello again to uh, so many of you that I've known in various chapters in my life. So it's, it's wonderful. And, uh, let me begin by saying thank you to Carolyn and to the University uh, Women's Club of Winnipeg for this wonderful invitation to be with you today. Congratulations to Diane and all the organizing committee for your tremendous work. It's greatly appreciated and thank you to each and every one of you for coming today. I uh, very much ap appreciate your uh, attendance. And a special welcome to Councillor Debbie Sharma. Debbie, stand up, please. <laughs> Councillor Sharma is the first woman to become Speaker of the City of Winnipeg Council. Bravo. <laughs> so today, my presentation to you will be a little bit of history, a little bit of sharing of my uh, personal experiences, and uh, 
hopefully uh, my end message will be a, an inspiration for you all. The University of the University Women's Club of Winnipeg has most certainly led the way for women, beginning with its first president, Dr. Mary Crawford. I really wanted the opportunity to acknowledge that today. The, uh, the club is a very important club in the history for women in our city. On January 27, 1914, a large delegation of both men and women appeared before the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba once again to present the case for granting women the right to vote in provincial elections. Included in this group of representatives were representatives from the Political Equality League, the Grain Growers Association, the Young Women's Christian Association, the Trades and Labor Council, the Icelandic Women's Suffrage Association, the Canadian Women's Christian Temperance Union. Dr. Mary Crawford of the University Women's Club of Winnipeg was the person who introduced the five speakers, two women and three men, and the last person to address the lawmakers was Mrs. Nellie McClough. And of course, with great perseverance by these people and groups, Manitoba, as you know, became the first province to grant the vote to most women on January 28, 1916. So my presentation to you today is Women in Politics, Leading the Way. The University Club of Winnipeg has in fact had three members become the national president of the Canadian Federation of University Women, and the latest being our own Doris Nailton. Stand up, Doris Nailton. As Doris May has said, the CFUW itself is seen to be a great training ground for women politicians. In the last federal election, there were five women who were elected from CFUW members. The University Women's Club of Winnipeg and the CFUW are very important vehicles for women who want to lead the way for our country. Carolyn, thank you to you and your members for all the good and important work that you do. I chose the title Women in Politics Leading the Way because I sincerely believe that we are in another profound moment in time when women must simply achieve more representation in all levels of government. We have all had those moments in our lives when someone has said something to us that absolutely resonates with us. One of those moments for me came from Rosie Abella, a Supreme Court of Canada Justice. It happened in the spring of 1990. I had received an invitation from Kim Campbell when she was Canada's Minister of Justice to attend a national retreat of women whose sole purpose would be to provide opportunities for women and that our job would be to open doors for women. Kim sent out 2,000 invitations to women leaders across Canada to join her for a weekend, which we all personally paid for, and it was to discuss and promote this goal. Only 60 people would be confirmed to attend out of the 2,000 invitations, and it was simply on a first-come, first-served basis. And trust me, when the facts came through the machine at Bert Savory, I went, I have no idea how I got on the list. I didn't care. I filled it in and I sent my money in and I wanted, I thought this is a chance of a lifetime. On the Friday night of the first retreat, we all gathered at a welcoming reception. A room filled with women leaders from all across Canada. And I can assure you 
that I was in awe of the women there and also very, very intimidated. Kim welcomed us and then introduced Rosie Abella, who at the time was on the Ontario Supreme Court. It was what happened next that reached deep inside me and resonated to my very core. Justice Abella said to all of us, and I paraphrase, the laws of Canada were made by men for men. For women to have equality and opportunity, we women must become lawmakers. It is Parliament who makes the laws of Canada, and therefore we need more women in Parliament. We need more women in all levels of government. Justice Abella's remarks absolutely helped solidify my decision to run in the 1992 election. I sincerely hope that today I will say something that will solidify one of you, some of you, to take up the mantle and run for political office. The need is now. The current 26% of women in Parliament means that we would reach the 50% parity rate in the year 2115, which would be 98 years from now. Let me repeat, we need more women in politics leading the way. Part of my mission today is to encourage women to run for political office. Do not underestimate how vulnerable we in our society are. In the March 1st, 2017 National Post, an article was done on a groundbreaking survey by the Toronto and I, <laughs> Environics, have I got it right? Thanks, Doris May, Institute. 62,918 respondents occurred in 60 countries around the world. It was a historic survey. One statement in that survey was, women are just as qualified as men to lead our country. In the category, totally agree, the results were only 62% of respondents in Canada agreed with that statement. Only 62% of the respondents think that women are just as qualified as men to lead our country. Western Europe came in at 77%, Latin America came in at 85%, and before you ask, the United States of America came in at 43%. <laughs> so here we are in a supposedly educated, progressive country in which only 62% of those respondents believe that women are just as qualified as men to lead our country. The president of Chile said, the biggest challenges everywhere for women are political participation, economic empowerment, and ending the violence against women. No country is spared, even in the most advanced countries, she said, where women have been elected prime ministers or presidents, Female candidates are still subjected to sexist jokes and comments. Salary gaps persist. And there are still too few women in major public and business positions. She goes on to say, for me, a better democracy is a democracy where women do not only have the right to vote and elect, but to get elected. Amen. Let me share with you some City of Winnipeg and Manitoba history. 
1920, Jessie Kirk became the first woman to be a city councilor. And also in 1920, Edith Rogers became the first MLA woman in Manitoba. Then we have to go forward 43 years, and it would be in 1963 that Margaret Conant became the first woman member of parliament for Manitoba. In 1963, Thelma Forbes became the first woman to be speaker in the Manitoba legislature. And in 1971, Muriel Smith became Deputy Premier. <laughs> Within city government, we had to wait until 1979 for Pearl McGonigal to become the first woman Deputy Mayor in Winnipeg. 1984, Sharon Carstairs becomes the first woman to lead a provincial political party. and. 2013, Debbie Sharma becomes the first woman speaker of city council. This history has been no walk in the park for any of us. It has required a lot of hard work, passion for city, province, country, and it has required perseverance. All of us must simply believe and embrace its importance in our lives. So many, many times I have had people just not women, say to me, I could never go into public life. Well, okay, but you can help those who do. And how can you do that? Here are some suggestions. Join and support groups like this group, the University Women's Club of Winnipeg. Support Equal Voice of Manitoba, who are doing a full day campaign school in May and who nationally were the group who organized the Daughters of the Vote that happened on International Women's Day, where all the young girls went to Ottawa. And I don't know about the rest of you, but the vision of seeing those young girls in every seat in Parliament, do we remember? I mean, what? It was fabulous, absolutely fabulous to see that photo. And Debbie, don't feel any pressure, but I'm sure you're going to do that at City Hall for International Women's Day next year. Do we think that's a good idea? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Debbie, but yes, let's do that. And of course, you can join and support LEAF, the Legal Ed Education Action Fund for Women. There are a plethora of groups and organizations that can support, you can support and get involved with. The timing right about now is important. At the very least, I ask that you support an elected woman that you admire and respect. Elected officials are not punching bags or doormats for society to dump on. When was the last time you picked up the phone or even wrote a note to an elected official saying that you appreciate the job that they do and that you say thank you to them. When was the last time you visited their constituency offices, attended their community functions to get to know them? Do not count on social media for telling you the truth about what is really going on. When it is election time, go to the mayoralty forums it is a life experience, trust me. It's something that every citizen should participate in. My point is, is there is opportunity here for you to help make a difference. Also on International Women's Day, I don't know if you saw it, but Air India was the first airlines to fly around the world with an all-female crew on International Women's Day. The pilot, the co-pilot, all the attendants, all the women on the ground, all the ticket. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful demonstration. And then I loved down in uh, New York, the fearless charging bull and the fearless girl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are just these wonderful statements going on, and I, I mentioned them 
to, to plant a seed as to what we can all do on International Women's Day next year. Iceland announced on International Women's Day that it will be the first country in the world to make employers prove they offer equal pay regardless of gender, ethnicity, sexuality, or nationality. And Scotland Yard now has its first female chief inspector, Christina Dick. And are we not going to have a new head of the RCMP in Canada? <laughs> okay, just a minute. Opportunity is knocking. <laughs> At least I think so. Our country of Canada is precious. We are the luckiest people in the world to be citizens of such a great country. For a country to flourish, it must realize its potential of all of its citizens, particularly that part of its citizenry that is over 50% of the population. So, to all of you and to each of you, as the late Jack Layton said, rise up, rise up. The next chapter needs us women. Thank you. wonderful. I know that there are a lot, if not every woman in this building, who has led a committee or been involved in something at their workplace, perhaps even just ruled the home. <laughs> we all do that. But not many of us have gone that one step further and gone for public office. And I know I don't feel I have the energy or the years left to do that, but I think you're right, Susan. We have to encourage the younger women, and we have to show our support. And whatever we can do, no matter what it is, we need to get more women out there. Thank you very, very much for the inspiring talk. Now comes the time when, of course, Susan's going to be a little embarrassed. <laughs> this this part here you won't be. <laughs> you can stand up for that. You're gonna have to stand up for this other one because now it gets to be the fun time. Oh yes, now he's got a peak already. This is a picture courtesy of Sheila Marchensky, known as Sheila Rutherford, grade five, Linwood School, 1957-58, grade five with Mr. Gibson. And I think we'll put this at the signing table. And everyone can try and pick you out. Don't tell them. They, you, you can tell where you are. Now, one thing here is Sheila's not in here. She was away that day. Yes, and she still has the picture. And the picture she has at home has your signature on the back. Your grade five signature. <laughs> Who's the one that knows Ross Smith? Here he is. <laughs> The other one in the picture is Gail Sykes Carson over here, right? Who wrote the foreword in the book, and we have been friends for. Uh, let me see, seven years old now. A long time. Sixty-three years. Her three children are my godchildren, so she's here. Well, there we go. We'll put that out. The uh, the desk, the table has been moved, and. Um, both Terry and Susan will be sitting at the table with their books and have a sweet chat, a sweet, a short, <laughs> a short chat with you while uh, she signs, they sign their books. Now, 
You're not the only author in the building. Yes, there's a whole bunch of us here. There are two of our University of Women's Club books here. One is 54 Westgate, and the other is the first women of 54 Westgate, and it's only the women. Now, I want you to take special note of the wrapping paper. That is because I want you to remember that you left this beautiful, beautiful province, and this is what you're missing. This is, this is what she's missing. Giant mosquitoes. And she left for that. Thank you again, and we'll see you at the front. Now, 